All right. So we will go ahead and get started. I got me stuck here. Taking some medicine. So we're going to talk about post-secondary transition. Okay. And we're going to talk about uh, student needs. And Will's probably a much better expert in this than I am when it comes to post-secondary transition. Because he works with this all the time. Um, but I have to read this. I'm going to start out with this kind of funny story. So my son, like I told you, graduated from Knox Central High School this past school year. And uh, I just knew Will from work from uh, here, basically, at KVEC, our employment specialists and our FMD teachers had the opportunity to work with them a lot more than I had uh, over there at the, at the school and in the, in the, in the district. But uh, my son had the opportunity to be a peer tutor. Do you all have peer tutors at your high school? Okay. All right. Wonderful, wonderful program. I can't say enough about it. So, uh, what my son uh, learned through being a peer tutor probably um, helped him grow to be a better person and to be um, just better in life, a better person in life. But anyway, my son comes home and uh, he's always telling me he was doing these activities, he was helping the students with below incidents and categories, he was helping them do this, helping them do that, da, 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 da. And my son, I never thought I would have this difficulty. He graduated high school. He had no idea what he wanted to go into. He had no idea where he wanted to go to school. He had, uh, he had, to the, and it got to the point that if I even brought up his future to him, he shut down. I totally shut down. It just overwhelmed him to that point. And uh, and I thought, here I am trying to push transition and pathways and everything on kids all the time. And yet here I have a child at home, uh, excels academically. Um, never had any behavior problems out of it. Uh, that is totally lost and totally shuts down every time that I try to discuss it with him. He got to the point that he would say, Mom, can we talk about anything else? And uh, so through being up here tutored and playing, he came home one day and he said, uh, Mom, I said, yeah. He said, uh, I made up my mind. He said, uh, he said, I think I have. He said, I, I want to be a nurse. He said, I don't want the level of support. I don't want the, to be a doctor. I don't want that level of responsibility on me. Uh, he really, you know, fought into this deep and hard. And uh, he said, but I met somebody at school today uh, in that in the special class. He said, uh, his name is Will. I didn't say a word. <laughs> I didn't say a word. He said, and he talked to me. And so it wasn't just that it wasn't just the students that had disabilities that Will impacted. He also impacted a regular education student. And he said, he said, I met this guy, and his name is Will. And, and Mom, he talked to me about my future. And he talked to me about my plans. And he asked about my ICT score. And he asked about uh, what I would like to do and, and where I would like to live. And and you know, it, and, I, and I thought, I couldn't talk to you about it because you shut down on me, but he let Will talk to him about it. And once we were done that, it opened the door. And honestly, it opened the door. It was life changing. <laughs> so I came back over here to came back for a second and I, I ran into Will. I said, Will, I said, you opened the door, the secret door, I said, I couldn't get, and then I couldn't get into it. But that's, that's a great story. It is, it, it is, honestly. And like I said, I cannot say enough about peer tutoring because it does not gel. It, it impacts kids, not just in that moment, but for life. They build a compassion, they build a work ethic. Um, I mean, it's just, you know. It helps them appreciate where they're at. Yes, it does. Compared to what their peers experience. And so what I wanted to share with you, and I'll come visit, because I lead the peer support network in the region. And there's some opportunities for you all to be a part of that. Um, actually, we have peer support network teacher fellows, and by participating, they actually get a thousand dollars over the course of the year to participate. Um, so I'll come visit with you, you know, and we'll talk about that, and, and I'll share some resources with you and, and connect you to some teachers. I've got seven schools participating this year. Seven. Seven. Seven schools, seven FMD. Yeah, yeah, so we're doing good. 
Okay, we're going to talk about post-secondary transition. We're going to talk about compliance, okay? And uh, I want, like I said, I want your all's email and everything so I can send this and send this to you. Uh, the compliance document that came out last year, I, along with <laughs> Denny Palmer, I don't think it covers it to the level that it needs to be covered, okay? The one that we were using previously before they took away the numbers and everything, or the ABCD, um, covers it in a lot more detail, okay? And I feel like that we owe that to our families. We owe that to our kids, and we owe that to, you know, to, um, to them. Uh, so, so the way I train in my district is the same way that I'm going to train you, okay? That we're going to talk about this and have discussions about this today. So... And I'm going to give you some uh, resources instead of taking you through. So, in order for to make compliance, there's nine, that's what I tell my teachers, there's nine areas that we're going to have to cover, okay? We're going to have to cover our post-secondary goals. We're going to have to cover our transition services. We're going to have to cover our agency involvement and our consent for outside agency invitation, the multi-year course of study, related annual goals, transition assessments, student involvement, and annual update, okay? These are the nine components that you have to cover, okay? You have to cover them in your IEP, and then you're going to document that you cover them in your conference summary, okay? That will keep you compliant, these nine, nine areas. So we're going to discuss each one of them, and you have a sample of the IEP that I gave you earlier. We'll look for them in there too, okay? Paul secondary goes. The IEP includes appropriate, measurable post-secondary goals aligned to uh, other available student information, such as the present levels, student interests, uh, preferences, and related to, and then we have these three categories we're going to talk about. So when you're writing post-secondary goals, we want it to be fluid. So the areas that you document that the student has difficulty or weaknesses with in their present level under the transition portion or maybe it's an academic portion that they're going to need additional education or training on. Those are going to be the same areas that you're going to want to write your transition goals on. Okay, they need to match. So that's why I'm talking about it being fluid. So for our population that we're talking about today, you have to have training or education and employment but here it says, when appropriate, independent living. So our students, we're going to have to have not only address the training and employment, but we're going to have to address the independent living, okay? Because if they're significantly disabled, we're going to have to address all three. So here's some examples, and I'm sure that you've probably seen these before, about um, writing, uh, writing goals and the requirements for those. So we have to put the student's name, have to be specific in here. I can't tell you how much that they require you to be specific. And if you had any training on this at all, that's what they told you. That after high school, Cinda's goal is to attend, wherever I'm going to attend, to become whatever, and they wanted you to be specific about the employment, exact job that they're going to be doing. Now, I mind you, this can change, just like my son. Right now, we think, you know, nursing, he's pretty set on it, but he could get there and possibly change his mind, okay? And that happens with our students, too. As they go through high school and they have opportunities to do career exploration and job shadowing and be out in the community, they may find something that they're more interested in that they want to, that they want to go to. So, therefore, they may change their mind. But if they change their mind, we need to make sure that their IEP and their goals and everything match up and that we're fluid. So, anyway, the education training, of course, what training or education does the student need, do we need uh, to provide to them to help them to accomplish these things? And then, of course, here's some examples. Uh, upon the completion of high school, this goal is to receive on the job training at the local library to be able to work as an assistant store teller. Okay? Um, when we think about the low incidence area, a lot of times if they're not receiving a diploma and they're not going on to college or to, per se, per se uh, 
CTE pen or electrical or this or that, uh, they, may, they may not be able to have the criteria, they may not have the ability to hold down um, the job as a veterinarian per se. But they may be able to work at the veterinarian, uh, walking the animals, feeding the animals. So, so you have to think about some of the things that they are capable of doing. And I don't like to be the dream buster. I don't like to be the dream buster. But we have to be realistic when we're talking with families and when we're talking with uh, students. Uh, it's imperative and important that we are. I do not believe in allowing a student to come in and have a goal of being a doctor or an NBA basketball player if they do not have the capability of doing that. We have to be realistic. And sometimes those are difficult and hard conversations that we have to hold, but it's important that we're realistic and we're honest with families and parents. Um, the next goal here uh, is an example. After graduation, Cindy's goal is to receive on-the-job training at the local church to be able to volunteer as a children's church teaching assistant. Okay? So, um, that's what I hear most often from my FMD teachers. What am I going to, what kind of goal am I going to write for this child? This, uh, Cindy, you don't understand. Uh, they're in a wheelchair. Cindy, they're on birth. Cindy, they, they, uh, uh, they don't even make eye contact. I can't tell whenever they are, whenever the communication is, uh, they're, in, you know, voluntary or involuntary. You know, I don't know. And um, I've had these conversations with any concrete. We have to think about where we want that child to be. And we have to think about the technology and things that may come in the future that would get them to that goal. Okay? Um, and like I said, we have to be realistic. But I think sometimes we get in the mindset of thinking a uh, doctor, a uh, lawyer, a uh, teacher, and things that, you know, that you hear a lot of around, you know, here. But, okay, let's think for a second. What could they maybe do? What kind of job could they hold in the school if they couldn't be, if they couldn't be a teacher? What could be a job that they could possibly hold in the school with? Awesome. So then maybe some, some of these shirts require a diploma for that. That's what Some require to take the options from that. Okay, those are skills that we can work on at school. Um, could they volunteer at school? Like a, like a volunteer at school. How about, like I gave the example of uh, maybe could be a veterinarian, but they could maybe assist with the dog grooming, uh, with the dog walking. We call them veterinary assistants. Veterinary assistant. Uh, so there's that, possibly in the veterinary job. Um, how about um, fast food? Is there anything that they could do? Fast food wise? Just can. Some do, some don't. Um, it, it just depends on the on the facility and the connections you make. Uh, I also I think about um, like right now, um, I suppose we have students working at the hardware store. Uh, what what what's a skill that they can do maybe do at the hardware store? This little girl's working in floral. She's separating flowers and stuff out by colors and, and uh, that kind of thing for the floor. Um, but also at the hardware store, what would be something else that maybe we could teach our classroom in order that maybe other students could do? To organize supplies. Supplies, stocking and shelves. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, um, stocking shelves, like you said, organizing supplies. Um, back to the custodial things. Um, we have students right now that are working part time, that's not required because it's a diploma at Food City. Um, they can't be the cashier per se. They're training on some of that, but they can buy the groceries. They can buy the groceries. Um, and another thing too, I talk, we talk a lot with the parents about Tanya Conn. She's wonderful. She's one of my employment specialists. She actually had um, had training, and we brought parents in to talk with parents about. Sometimes they're really concerned with the amount of money that their students. You know, and they're concerned that your student will no longer receive those benefits. But those students, but students can earn so much money. And children, uh, and not just children, but I mean, as adults, they can earn so much money and still not lose their jobs. And you know, we want them to be productive members of society. And we don't want kids to just graduate high school, go home, and sit there and not have you know other things to do. 
we ha also have some uh, students that are working at some uh, daycares. Um, you know, there's things that they can do, like help them with some of the, the you know, different things. Carl and Perkins is wonderful, um, the, the Perkins Center or whatever. Um, they provide a lot of opportunities uh, for, for students. Especially the low incidence population. In fact, their public relations officer will be here during lunch. She's going to do a little five minute cameo. I was with her yesterday. She follows me around everywhere. So she'll be here. Good. So if you do not have the opportunity to do a to take your kids at the high school level to call day, I can't say nothing about it. And like I said, it doesn't just impact the, the special students, it also impacts regular. Because my son come home, my son got to go to call day to tour with the other kids and come home and say, Mom, I said, Jason. Did you know that Cody, they have a nurse on staff? What? When I said, I said yes. He said, the kids live in dorms. And I was like, yes. And he was like, well, they hire nurses there. That's not like a hospital or a doctor's office. And I'm like, no. <laughs> right, and there's nurses. I said, do you have a nurse at school? Yeah, but I never thought about it. He, I mean, he hadn't thought about it. When he thought nurse, he thought hospital. He thought doctor's office. So, I mean, it opens up a lot of different opportunities. They have a lot of... Um, Opportunities with food service. They have a lot of opportunities with uh, secretarial work and filing and the answer calls. And the kids can learn a, lo a lot of things. And they have about 18 certificate programs. They and then one. there's they have 18 different certificate programs at Carly Perkins, which is in Delma, just outside of Paintsville. Yes. And they're also affiliated with the Job Corps, which is there in Prestonsburg. And of course, there are four different Job Corps sites in the state of Kentucky. But the other thing that is really cool about Perkins is they offer the students dual credit opportunities at the community college because we have such a cross-section of students in our low incidence classes. I mean, some of them could do those things. We have a lot of students in our nation that also gravitate toward Mount Ponce Greenhouse. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, so they can learn a lot of skills that you all brought in, like the plants and the seeds, and you know what I'm saying? They can learn a lot of those things with uh, even through alternate assessment that we talked about earlier with the planting and the growing and all that. Those are skills that that can be generalized over to you know working on the greenhouse, watering plants, watering plants. So there's a lot of different things. We have to think of it a little bit. We have to think about it a little bit differently sometimes. Um, also, with like our independent living guidance, again, like taking care of our self care needs at Carl Perkins if they do go there. Uh, and back to communication once again, expressing our wants and needs. And then we have transition services. Um, we have to list those inside the IEP. Flip over into your IEP. See if you see the transition services that are listed. Okay. So there's. So there's, there's some transition services there. There may be more transition services that, that you think of or that a family thinks of. Um, and you have to document the agency that's going to be responsible for those transition services. But these are required components. Um, whenever I think of uh, transition uh, services, here's some examples that I think of. And like I said, these may be uh, in there, some of them may not be. But of course, a study leading to a diploma certificate, instructional support, um, instruction related to social skills, job shadowing opportunities, community based uh, transition work programs, uh, assistant tech services, uh, touring higher education campuses, or like uh, we were talking about Carl D. And then also, you want to make sure that they have the opportunity maybe to speak with someone in admissions or to seek out the disability services office at that location, uh, completing interest inventories, completing career inventories, completing vocational rehabilitation uh, referrals. So those are some transition service examples of things that you may do or Everybody does it kind of, uh, kind of a little bit, uh, a little bit differently. But I do want to pass, I do want to pass some of these out. These are some that we use in Floyd County. I'm sure that your district has some that may be uh, a little bit similar, a little bit, uh, a little bit different. This is a parent guardian transition survey that we use to discuss the student's future. And then here is also a student survey, another one that we use. Uh, and sometimes you will have students that are higher functioning that you can ask these questions to that will be able to talk to you a little bit about some of those. Um, 
<clears throat> as part of our, our audio piece of things that, that we do, we also we also use these. These are free. You can uh, get these actually off of uh, online or whatever. But this is a picture in your inventory, okay? That your students can use because you have that documentation that you've done this with your students. And sometimes the picture interest inventories for our students make more sense and they're able to understand them a little bit better than if we just, um, but anyway. And if you go online and you print these out, you can just type, uh, type this in. The pictures are actually in color. Okay? So you can just go online and you can print that out. It's free. Oh, so I want to give you some examples of uh, some of those. These are all components that we use in district for, for uh, student interest in inventory. Okay? This is also another one that's free. This is career cluster interest inventories where you can ask some kids some questions. You can always show pictures that correspond with each of these. To, uh, and then there's a little score sheet on the back of it. If you look, that will tell you if their interests are, it picks out the top three. To let you know if they're interested in education and training, if they're interested in something with health science, if they're interested in something to do with transportation, uh, law enforcement, uh, food, natural resources. It gives a little bit of indication as to what that child may be interested in. So I wanted to give you those. Um, and then I wanted to give you this too. This is the website for the picture interest inventory. And then down here is age appropriate transition toolkit. And then up here is some additional coordinating services. Okay, so I wanted to give you a copy of these web addresses. We're going to check out these free resources. But they're free, even better, right? And sometimes um, it's a little bit more difficult to get the IOPs completed with our students. Okay? In Floyd County, we have actually taken, I can't pull it up because of confidentiality, or I, or I would show it to you, but when I pull it up, it actually lists the students. Um, Floyd County schools develop their own IOP process. Okay? And, um, we have like inside the instructional hub, our teachers and students have the opportunity to log in and all of these different types of surveys, career clusters, interest inventories, um, their multi-year course of study gives the opportunity for them to generate a resume. It also gives the opportunity for them to make a, uh, a digital portfolio. So over the from the time they're 14, they keep working on it. By the time they're senior year, they should have it completed. So you all created that yourself? Yes. Mike Bell. Mike Bell is our digital learning coach in the district. I can't say enough about the man. He could probably earn millions working for somebody, <laughs> working for you, working for himself. But he basically uh, went to KDE and he took the digital uh, IOP uh, playbook, all the recommendations that they have for like each grade level that is in here and he built our own. Okay, so he built he built our own. And so as like I said, the student has got we can go ahead and see how far a student is with uh, completing it. And um, and all of these tools are already in there. They're in there and loaded the students just have to go and complete them. And we use that advisor advising time for uh, we use that advisor advising time to actually sit down with students and make sure that these things are getting completed. Because if you just uh, tell the students to do it, it may or may not. So uh, we make sure that we sit down and the only way that we can do that is the teacher has to click off and verify that, it, that it's done before it can generate, generate over. But like I said, it is on our instructional hub. It's absolutely a wonderful pick sign. Enough good things. Yes, enough good things about that. I'll hand out some more resources here in just a second. So, out of curiosity, yes. um, are you all still uh, subscribing to Wayne Learning, the K version? We, ha we still have access to it, but we're not, you. We're not using it. We went strictly over to iWords in the. Yeah, yeah. But now, Wayne Learning has some free resources. 
like you can get online and you can look at they have some free but we were in the transition process last year or whatever and now we're up fully running you need to come over and meet with Mike and see the instructional app it's amazing yeah yeah which yeah. we use I think career yes so I think it would be nice to have like a folder on the students all of their progress especially resumes but, uh, so for the book rack we have uh, I was thinking about the age for a eight for a paper yes I know I have just certain things that I um, so when do you when does the state recommend that they be invited to the meeting? Sixteen. Okay. We had a question about that last school year and so I just wanted to make sure well, I we start in Boy County, we start inviting the we start inviting the students uh, you know later. Eight, well, eight, 14. 14 years of age. But Oak Creek doesn't have until later on, yes. In high school. Um, our employment specialists work closely with Oak Creek to, so to try to reach that gap a little bit. But Oak Creek have, honestly, they don't have enough staff members to right. come to Avery. I worked at high school before for four years. I right. remember it was really, but I thought that I invited them, but yes. I wasn't sure about Avery. Right. So, usually, we, do it, so. we usually do it more toward their junior senior year. Uh, yes. Uh, to actually get them in to get the paperwork completed for like the referrals and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but our employment specialists work closely to the employment specialists. We invite them to all the high school. Yeah, we invite them to the high school because that's where they're stationed at right now. Primarily just with the MMD, we do have them attend some of our local functioning MMD uh, ARC meetings or that, you know, just occasionally. Just to try to give the parents some resources as to where to go and what to, you know, things like that. But um, we're going to talk about that requirement here just a bit because that's part of your compliance. Um, agency involved. For transition services, likely to be provided or paid for by another agency, the other agency is invited to send a representative if appropriate. Okay? This is going to come back to your ARC, your notice. Okay? Um, you have to document on the notice and in the conference summary whether or not that outside agency like Book Rehab was invited to attend the meeting, okay? With that is the consent for outside agency invitation, okay? You cannot put on the notice that you're inviting an outside agency to come and participate unless you get consent from the parent prior that it's okay for us or okay for you to invite someone from an outside agency to attend, okay? So you have to get that consent prior to sending out that notice. And the other thing is, they used to be several years ago, you just had to get that notice signed one time and that was it. But now it's annual, okay? They've changed that, so now it's annual. Uh, so if you're going to invite uh, both rehab or if you're going to invite some type of uh, com community uh, work partner uh, that a child's going to be you know, working with or whatever it may be, you have to make sure that you get consent for an outside agency, you get it before the art meeting, or you can't invite them. Okay, you have to do this annually. But now there is a box on there that says it's not appropriate at this time. Okay, and if that box is checked that it's not appropriate at this time on your notice, then you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to uh, worry about inviting them to the meeting, okay? But you would want to put something in your conference summary that says it's not appropriate at this time. And then why it's not appropriate at this time. Okay. The next required component out of those nine is the multi-year course of study. Now flip over in your IEP, see if you can find your multi-year course of study. And uh, we're going to talk about this just a little bit. The multi-year course of study, like you have a student that comes to you and says they're in the 10th grade. The multi-year means multi-year. It has to be from at least your 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Okay? If, they, if you have a student that is a freshman that comes in, you're going to have, or a ninth grader, you're going to have all the classes that they're going to need to be able to graduate 9, 10, 11, and 12. Those classes need to match up with those goals that they have, the, the transition goals that you have. Okay? So you need to make sure that the multi year course of study has all those. Now, if you see down through there, your guidance counselors at, at the high school level I have these 600 level codes. Okay, those are for your students that are participating in alternate assessment. You should have resources and materials inside your classroom to teach that. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to you know, share that. 
So if you look down through, if you look down through there, um, I don't know what this link here, this student. Um, some of these are not from 600 level courses. If you look at the bottom of their 10th grade year, they have media arts down there. Sometimes I will have kids that may have an um, art class. Um, and let me give you an example of that right quick. So it must, must align with the student ILP and be at least from the current year that's expected. Okay, so you want to make sure that you have all the, every course that they're going to need. Can this change? Yes. Okay. It may be that their junior, senior year that they're going to be taking other classes. Um, let me give you an example of what would work and would not work. Okay. If you have a student and per se, his transition goal, his employment, is that he is going to uh, work at, as an like, auto mechanic. He's wanting to learn some of those skills like, you know, changing oil, that kind of thing. But you have him in an electrical class. Does that match up? No. He should be in some type of automotive class. Okay? Another, another example of this, I had a student that his, um, his post-secondary transition goal, uh, whenever he graduated, he wanted to own his own business. And he wanted to uh, make greeting cards. He could draw. I mean, uh, the things that he could draw, I mean, was just amazing. He wanted to set up festivals and things, and he wanted to own his own business and sell greeting cards. So what kind of elective class do you think he needed to be in? Art? That would be appropriate, and it would match. See what I'm saying? So we have to make sure that the multi-year course of study matches up with those goals. That were, that, and like I said, it can change from year to year. There's some other, like when we were talking about the goals just a minute ago, and like I said, it's sometimes it's hard to come up with the goals that these kids. Think about the things that they're working on inside your classroom. And think about some of the things like we talked about that uh, both rehab or quality different places offer. Okay? Inside your classroom, how many of you bake? Do some cooking skills, cleaning skills, okay? That will prepare them for a job cooking, cleaning, cleaning, you know, cleaning up uh, restaurants, wiping down tables, different things, okay? We have one student that liked to bake, that wanted to start her own, with, you know, parents' assistance, of course, but wanted to start some cupcakes, wanted to do baking, you know, work at the bake shop, okay? Then let's think about another student who wanted to do dog treats. You know the dog treats that you can make? We had one student, you know the lanyards that the teachers wear that have the different little colors and everything like that, and the hospital workers wear. Businesses, they wanted to start their own business to make those things, to sell those things either online or at festivals, things like that. So think about some of those things too because there's nothing that says that these kids can't start their own businesses, especially if they have like support, you know? Yeah, and that's one of the nice things, if I may interject, with the peer support network. And I, I will qualify by saying that KBAC didn't invent the peer support network, the tutor mentor program. It already existed for many years at schools like Not Central, mm -hmm. where your son just graduated from, Hype Central. What KBAC has done is come in and just added more resources and support. Speaking of that, one of the things that we're working on collectively on the peer support network across the schools is school-based enterprises. So going back to Not Central, they have a school-based enterprise in that Lawrence Simmons classroom where they were making so much money off the little coffee house, yes. the leadership said, you're making too much money, you need to dial it back a little bit, you're hurting all of our other little fundraisers. <laughs> I mean, they were making a ton of money. Um, we have coffee cart, like in some of our schools, we have coffee cart Friday. Uh, and some of the funds that they, you know, earn or whatever we look at, like, I suppose, for special Olympics, like additional, like, shirts and this and that, a lot of times that the money goes back in to purchase an additional coffee. Mm -hmm. Kids need to, need to understand that, that if you start a business uh, making cupcakes, you can't just go out and spend that money that you made. You have to have take that money to put back into making more cupcakes, you know what I'm saying? So there's a, a lot of things, the cupcakes, uh, also cookies. I've seen the cookie mm -hmm. house where they make cookies and they sell cookies one day a week and things like that. So there's nothing to say that they couldn't start their own business doing some of those things. Uh, and that would be an appropriate goal, you know, 
We have a lot of kids that want to start their, start their own businesses. So that's a more to your push study. Um, next is your related annual goal. Annual goals included in the IEP are related to transition service needs. So all of those service needs that we mentioned over here a few minutes ago, I just gave some examples here, but like interest inventories, if a student says that they're interested in working at the, you know, being there, working at the hair salon, the dude bar, whatever it is that they're going to do there, or they're working, interested in like food services or whatever, we need to make sure that the, that we have goals that address that, okay? It has to be included, they have to match. Um, you have to remember that education, training, employment must be checked. There's no way around that. And for our population, also independently on the IEP, okay? So if you look underneath those, if you look underneath the goals that were written for this student, you're going to see if it was for education and training, employment, or independent living. Now, sometimes you may have a goal. You may have a goal that hits both. You may have a goal that hits education and training and employment together. That does happen sometimes, okay? But you have to have, have those checked. Um, transition assessments, measurable post-secondary goals are based on age-appropriate transition assessments. That's what I talked to you about a little bit uh, earlier. These were some examples uh, that I gave you insight we talked about. Um, student involvement. This is another requirement of component of those first nine is the student involvement. The student is invited to the art meeting where transition services are discussed, like she mentioned back there at the high school level. If the student does not attend, I messed up here. I was typing back too fast. Uh, if the student does not attend the ARC meeting, the ARC team or the local education agency must ensure that the student's preferences and interests are considered. Okay? Now, sometimes you might have students that get very, very upset if they have to be transitioned into a meeting where their parent is and the parent's at school. Uh, it could be that um, the parent has legal guardianship of the, of the child and does not want them to participate in the ARC meeting. If that be the case, then you need to have some of these things that I gave you, these picture, uh, these picture inventories, the student's interest inventories. Some of those assessments completed that the art can discuss that that student had input, uh, that their interest uh, considered. <coughs> so it's best practice to invite, have the student there present, and to go over these things. But if not, these things have to be done previously so that you can document and discuss them with the ARC. But there has to be student involvement. That's one of the nine required components. The next is the annual update. The measurable post-secondary goals are updated annually. The conference summary needs to discuss if the goal changes or if the goal is remaining the same. Okay? So if the goal is changing, you're going to discuss why the goal changed. The child now decided they're interested in this. Multi-year course of study was also changed to match. Or if the goal is going to remain the same, you're going to put a statement in there that the goal remained the same and that the student is uh, going to continue on the on the on the same track. And we've got the same services, or you may want to add a few additional transition services. Now here's one of the things I want to tell you about annual goal update. Okay, if you have a photo review, a record review, and you need to meet for corrections, this is something for compliance that can't be corrected. Okay, I caution you on this. You can't be corrected. You can invite a student to a meeting and get that part corrected. You can um, complete a multi-year course of study that wasn't completed accurately and get that corrected. But you can't go back and update an annual goal if you miss that time. Okay? So that's one of the areas that cannot be corrected. If you did not meet in time, within the, the year, the 365 day timeline. And if you did not develop that child a goal by, by their 16th birthday, you can't go back and fix it. They're done past that. There's no way to make that portion compliant. Okay? We started doing ours in the Yes. I don't know if that's 
We did have, uh, we start doing uh, the interest inventories and things like yeah. that, and, uh, some of, but the actual goal itself is required at 16. And you can't go back and add that because it's not. And so, and it's not a big case. They didn't allow for the goals for a long time unless you got to 16. And if you miss it by a couple weeks, then you're just out of luck. Uh, you can't go back and fix it. So here's some other violations that cannot uh, be easily corrected. Uh, inviting an outside agency prior to getting consent. How can you correct it? They show up <laughs> and you didn't get consent from the parent, you can't correct it. Not inviting the student to the ARC where transition services are going to be discussed. That mark the student on the notice. Uh, you know, that they're going to, that they're going to be attended. But you can't these are not things that you can go back and correct easily. Missing the timeline for updating post secondary goals. If you don't update them annually and on time, can't go back and fix that. That's not an easy correction that you can make. And not having the transition requirements in the IEP by the 16th birthday. If the student's 17 or 16 in two weeks, <laughs> you can't go back. The timeline's missed. Okay? And so on the record review document, when you go down through there, there is no um, there is no easy fix for that. This is a transition <coughs> checklist for Indicator 13 that we use a lot in our district. This is on KBEC's website. I don't know if you've had the opportunity to get on there and to look at this. But this talks a lot about some of the things that you were talking about, about age 14, grade 8. Those are the things that have to happen by the time the student is in 8th grade or they are 14 years of age. And um, then you see down there, ages uh, 16 and above, the requirements. So this is a really, really neat checklist right here that you can um, access. And you see the I, you see down here the ILP uh, playbook. I'll give you a copy of that earlier. This is on KDE's website. Okay? Talks about the requirements concerning the multi-year course of study, concerning the ILP, and those requirements for these interest inventories that I gave you. And also that South Bend, South Bend Transition Assessment page, um, same. That's on KDE's website. So this checklist, like I said, is um, is very, 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 very good at helping you to um, make sure that you have that you make compliance. Like I said, these things right here. I highlighted those for you because these are things that are not easily fixed if you have an error, okay? So you need to be very cognizant that these things, um, you know. But ultimately, in order to meet compliance, those nine things, okay? Those nine things in your conference summary, in your IEP. And, and like I said, in your conference summary, you want to address each one of them. You want to say, in your conference summary, the ARC developed post secondary, uh, you know, post secondary goals. This is the goal for the uh, employment uh, and uh, education. This is the goal for independent living. And then you will have your transition services. In order to meet that goal, these transition services were discussed, and these are the people that are responsible for the transition services. Agency involvement. It wasn't appropriate at this time to invite anyone, or we invited and we got consent up front. Uh, consent. Then the multi-year course of study. The ARC reviewed the multi-year course of study. We determined that that in order to meet the goal, that so and so needed to participate in this class. Like I said, it needs to match. It needs to be fluid. And then you're going to have your related annual goals, your academic goals that you have. Do they relate to the transition? How do they relate? Are they employment goals? Are they transition goals? Um, your transition assessments. I gave you some examples of that. We've actually purchased, um, I'll have to get Susan Cooley Green to give you all the name of it. But we actually purchased a transition assessment for our low incidents just for, just for these purposes. Uh, how is the student involved? And of course, your annual update. These are the nine things that have to be there. Now, I'm going to give you a copy of each one of these, okay? These are career conversation starters, okay? So you may want to highlight some of these because these would help you to talk to a student to get information. 
is it also helps you to talk to the parent to get information to be able to document inside that conference summary that you discuss these things, okay? So there is some conversational starters, and that one, and then there's one for the middle school population. There's also one for the high school population, okay? So these are some career conversation starters. And like I said, I have found these to be uh, very beneficial when um, working with families because sometimes I, I just draw a blank. I don't know what it is. I, sometimes I just draw a blank or sometimes I feel like uh, I get repetitive and uh, I wouldn't necessarily say like force the same goals or uh, career options or whatever on students and, and parents and families. But, and I think our teachers sometimes they feel the same way that they are a little bit um, a little bit limited as far as what they want to discuss uh, with the parents or whatever. But uh, these talk about, you know, social skills, self-management skills. Um, there's questions for parents, uh, questions for the community. And like these would be good questions that you would, you know, maybe want to ask community partners that you're working with or uh, the uh, employment specialists like I was talking about to document that they're having difficulty with these things. That would be another thing that you could add back to your alternate assessment. But there's just questions and prompts, like what else would you like to accomplish this year? Um, what are your thoughts uh, on what would help you to succeed? Um, who are your strongest supporters? Ask the kids, who supports you? Who helps you? You know, who helps you? Those are some uh, good middle school uh, prompts. Um, tell me about some of the activities you're involved in. A lot of times, um, a lot of our kids are involved in youth groups, I found. Uh, they're involved in a lot of activities outside of school. And so that, again, goes back to the uh, community. Um, what would it take for your school to be amazing? What would it take for your, for your day to be amazing? I mean, some of these things uh, kids would be able to tell you. Um, describe a time that you felt successful. So, yeah, these are some good questions to get input. Like I said, uh, career uh, starters. And these would be some good things that you could um, include. You can have to put all of them, but some of them in your conference summaries to show that you're discussing things that are across multiple uh, settings. Um, but like I said, those are the nine components for call safe care transition that's required regardless if you're low incidence or you're not in the low incidence uh, uh, area. And like I said, the biggest thing that I have with my teachers, and I don't know if you all feel the same way, but is the goal, just writing the goal as to what that student would be able to accomplish and be able to do. And sometimes, uh, you know, they're like, how do I tell them that thing that they can't fly in How do I tell them that they can't be, you know, the MBA. Well, maybe they can't be in the MBA, but can they possibly work in the live session stand if they're involved? Can they possibly, can they possibly help with swimming floors in the ball game? Can they help with uh, the water? You know, there's other things that they can do that would still include some of those sporting activities if that's what they're interested in. There's still some things that they can do to incorporate some of the aspects of jobs that they make the life we can kind of think outside the box. Yeah, that's, that's tough. I, I get it. That's the hardest yeah. part for me. I don't think, you know, it's, that's what makes writing the goal hard, because writing the goal should be easy because you're getting the feedback from the students. Right. And then you're coalescing that into a placement, right? Right. But they want to be a veterinarian, but cognitively they don't have the ability to be a I get that. that part. And I've, I've been in and around those conversations a lot. It's, that's tough, I don't think it's really tough. Yes. Because I'm, I'm sure that... And they have a lot of students that's like my son that don't know. Mm -hmm. that, that the job blanks. Do you have that? Like, yeah. Okay. Some of your high school students, they don't know. That's why these interest inventories, and sometimes they have to be picture interest inventories, can give you a little bit of an idea about some of the things that they may be interested in. And then you have another cross-section of students because um, most of the students I, 
I work with, and I would say I'm in 20 plus high schools and 1,400 plus students um, over the course of the year that I'll have some contact with, usually multiple times throughout the year, some more so than others. I mean, so I've got some power users who would, would like me there every week, but that's not possible. But maybe I'm there every month because it's a special transition project. But here's where I'm going with this. The cross-section is I was at an alternative school that I work with uh, quite a bit. And it's, they've got a day treatment program, but they also have a credit recovery program in the same building. And I work with all those students. And I was working with a group of young ladies. They were probably 14, 15 years old. And so I try to, you know, I always, I'm always trying to engage them in transition conversations. What do you want to do? What do you like to do? You know, what are you interested in? I'm like, so, you know, what do you guys do on the weekends? And the, and the girls look at me like you, like the smoke and drink. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> you're telling me. <laughs> you know, so you've got that contingent of young people. You know, you've got the students that, I don't know, and you've got the students that have cognitive challenges that can't do what they think they want to do. And then you've got another group of students that are basically apathetic. Right? Um, they don't want to do anything but fool around. And so, but that's amazing to me that here, you know, I'm sitting in front of, you know, about seven or eight young teenage ladies. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're doing. And so, I'm like, are you serious? I'm like, we're not going to continue this conversation. Let's change the, change the topic, right? So, it's, it's tough. Transition is tough. You know, because you're dealing with... Do you all have to provide um, a lot of like, job shadowing opportunities to your kids? Virtual job shadowing? That's a wonderful thing that we're starting. Like, we're building our bank. I don't know if I, if I told you that or not. Oh, but Tanya's building a bank. Like, she's actually going to the veterinary's office. And she's actually going to the convenience store, to the dollar store, to the hardware store, and bringing those videos back for the kids to watch. Like, that was one of the big things like through COVID. If we couldn't take them there, if we could bring it to them. You, know, you see what I'm saying? So I think sometimes our kids don't know the opportunities that are available to them. Like, you know, in Prestonsburg, per se, those kids a lot of times gravitate toward Mount Comp to the greenhouse, okay? But the kids at Floyd Central don't because I don't know if it's I don't know if it's just because of the boundaries and the lines, because that's in town, this isn't in town. Those parents never really think about it. Um, so some different things, um, you know, like that, and I think sometimes they just don't know all the opportunities. I think that's the way with all all kids, uh, but especially the kids with in low incidence areas, you know. Um, and then the same way with the parents. A lot of times their parents just say, well, I want to protect them. I just want to keep them at home. I don't want them to go out in the community. Um, we've had that here recently. And, uh, that's been my biggest issue usually. I mean, I've had some, some students that didn't know, and we would just kind of explore different things. And, um, but the parents, uh, getting them on board, especially with the money issue. Yes. No, it would be good. I don't know. Is there like a way we know the exact Yes. Deal? There was a lady, I, I can send that information to you, uh, Tony Khan uh, gave me, that actually came in a presentation for us that told us the exact amount and all that kind of stuff because parents were concerned about their children's, uh, not just financial benefits, but health right. benefits. Right. Um, and medications and doctor visits and things like that. Um, that they were concerned about. Um, so there is like a, so much that they can work and money. You know, right mm -hmm. off will exactly the lady came from. Mm -hmm. Probably was it will. They they do a lot of outreach where they where they're willing to present information about you know there's a there's a certain amount of time that students can work without losing their SSI benefits because I can't even begin to tell you how many times I hear that from middle students teachers who have students that are very capable of yes. being employed, but their parents will not let them. Right. I, we had a student, um, a little in this past year or whatever, who did a tour at Carl Day. Um, the student was really excited. The parents were very apprehensive uh, and did not, you know, and we get into this art meeting and the student is very verbal and the student was like, I can do this. Mom, I can do this. And, um, 
they got in, and the students get to go. So, I mean, I think that they're going to do wonderful, but at the same time, I do understand, you know, as a parent, how hard and difficult that it would be, and how much I'm, you know, worried. It's that I, I think about, you know, it's just how it is. I think about whenever I was a teacher before I became a mom, um, I, that first day of school, I would see all these parents, I'd be like, why are they so upset? Why are these parents crying? Uh, you know, these kids are in kindergarten, they're going to be fine. We're professionals, we're educated, we're going to take care of them, nothing bad's going to happen. And then when I took mine to kindergarten, <laughs> <laughs> it's a different story this year. Uh, you know, you're leaving them with a stranger, basically. So, you know, uh, puts, things, puts things in perspective. Um, we've had, uh, we've had one, uh, a couple students in particular that went, <laughs> that went to call them, and uh, they had the ability to go and to stay, uh, but anyway, they got uh, they ended up uh, getting sent back home. Uh, they got a second try, they're going back again. But anyway, because they did not want to perform their grooming, uh, didn't want to brush their hair, didn't want to button their pants, that kind of thing, they had the capability to do it, but mommy had always done it for them. And I, you know, I think about that. I'm going to do that myself. Uh, I thought one more time, I thought if I checked my son's adaptive behavior, scores, scale, or whatever. Um, it's not that it, it's sort of that he couldn't, it's just I've done it for him all the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's one of the things I think, uh, too, even early on as a teacher. Um, there, have you all, you all heard the, about the hidden curriculum? Have you heard about the hidden curriculum? There's a book out. Um, but anyway, it's called the hidden curriculum. But Kovic's done some training, some things on that, too. But everything has to be taught. Things that we take for granted a lot has to be taught. And um, and I, and I think about that um, so many times with our kids. And I think about, too, we get in a fast pace and we get in a hurry. And I think about all the times that I open the kids' milk and I open the kids or threw the kids' tray away for them uh, so we could get back to the classroom. When really, that was a learning experience for them that I took away because I was in a hurry. Uh, I think about, about that kind of stuff. I think about some of the things that, that had to be taught. I took uh, my class to Jerry's one time. And um, they had kind of predetermined from the menu what they wanted to order. They ordered this and that. And when we got back uh, on the bus, and the little girl, she said, um, she said, uh, here, here, at the time I was Mr. Richardson, here, Mr. Richardson, you left your money on the table. I never thought to tell them about it here. I never thought to tell them why I was leaving that money <laughs> on the table. So I think there's a lot of things that we take for granted that we think that kids know that they don't know. Um, you know, um, Brenda Smith Miles uh, uh, is the author of that book. Um, I think it's Brenda Smith Miles. But anyway, the um, curriculum, and she gave the example of um, going to the restroom and these things that I had not thought about. Um, females, when we go to the restroom, she gave this example. Females go to the restroom, we go in a line. If you have to wait in line, you'll chit chat with the person in front of you, behind you, and I like your shoes, I like your hair, uh, where are you going, what did you know, what did you stop here for, are you enjoying the concert, whatever. And then you go in line to the next, you go to the stall, and if the next stall's available, you go to the next one that's open, and the next one, the females go in line. Were we taught that? No, it's just instinct. Something maybe we seen from our mommies, or you know, when we, you know, as we were growing up, men don't do that. Boys don't do that. If they have to be taught that, children, especially you know, kids in low incidence areas, they have to be taught that. For example, she gave an uh, example when men go to the restroom. Usually, uh, they go to the one on the end. If another man comes in, he will go to the one on the other. They don't line up beside each other because that, you know, is inappropriate uh, for men. And they think about it in terms of, you know, the child could possibly be molested or neglected, you know, something like that. Men don't talk in the restroom. Well, nobody ever told me that men don't talk in the restroom, don't speak to the, in the restroom. <laughs> if I go into the restroom and I accidentally realize that there is no toilet paper in there, Maybe, I'm, I think about it more now, especially when I was a young girl, I would probably say, you wish me some toilet paper? I'm going to you some toilet paper. Me and Dolly, she gave it to 
which is if me and them take off their socks, they'll take off their underwear, they will find something else. You know what I'm saying? They will not ask, ask for that. And so I went home and I thought about that. And I went home and I asked my cousin, I said, Utah, I said, when you go into the restroom, I said, and there is a, there's a weight line. I said, would you speak to the other men in the restroom? No. And I said, I said, if you went to the restroom and you realized that there wasn't any toilet paper, I said, did you ask for additional toilet paper? No. I said, what would you do? He said, I would look first. He said, you make sure that's there first before you, you know. But I never really, you know, I never really thought about it. Um, there's so much that we take for granted that our kids just automatically know. I mean, like, Sweep of the floor and the position of the broom. You just automatically think that if you got a, a, a broom that's on an angle, that they know how to, to hold that. And why? So there's just so many things that we take for granted that we think that they know that we don't. Um, and those transition skills, like I said, those things have to be taught. Um, those skills have to be uh, worked on and taught. The transition services. And a lot of times, whenever you're looking at the um, Agencies that's responsible. A lot of times they list the high school, and high school is responsible. Sometimes uh, it is both rehab, and sometimes it's hard to get both rehab in, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, or outside agencies. So you know you have to make sure that whatever you put on there is doable, and you have to make sure that it can happen. So, like I said, those are the big nine pillars. Um, make sure they're in your IEP, make sure they're discussing your conference family, and then you don't have to worry about making the transition requirements. It's a lot for them to do. And the best thing to do is just get your feet wet. Because, um, I'll just, the time's up. I'll just be honest with you, there is no perfect paperwork. There is no matter how many times you do it. Um, you can get close. You can get close. Um, but it's never going to be perfect. Um, so give yourself some grace. Um, the other thing uh, is um, you got tough jobs, you got hard jobs because, and a lot of people don't realize that unless they've been in your shoes, that you're not just having to focus on instruction. You're also having to focus on the health and safety of the kid. That is a lot, usually a lot more intense. And then you're also having to focus on compliance. So um, you have to find a balance healthy balance between instruction and compliance and the bottom line is special education teachers are, are, are accountable for both and so it, um, it's not easy it's not easy but I will say this um, special education teachers that I've worked with it didn't matter if they were in our district or out of our district they had the biggest hearts they had the most compassion and they would, and I think that's because they would not have ever went into this if they didn't have to start with. 